NSFW, crime scene cleanup crew members of Reddit, what is your most disturbing story? I'm not a crew member, but I got a story. A few years back, I couldn't get a hold of my brother, so my stepmom and I drove out to make sure he was okay. He lived two hours from me, and we haven't heard from him in two weeks. Not uncommon for him he did do a lot of drugs and was a very solitaire guy, I crawled in a window, and I didn't smell anything nasty. It just smelled like a musty old house. Anyways got the door open, and we found him in his room. He was definitely a few weeks into decaying. He was very bloated, and there was blood all over the room. I didn't initially see maggots, but from the report, there was a ton in him that they missed taking the bullet in his head for maggots on the x-ray. We had to go back the next day to his house, and I found his tooth in the closet door rails on the floor. Also, the house smelled horrible oddly after the body was removed. His hair was stuck to the carpet, and a few maggots were on the floor. To deter anyone from suicide, he shot himself in the head and lived long enough to put the gun under his mattress, and he laid down waiting for death getting blood all over his mattress. I believe the bullet was a 22, he realized that it was a mistake and got up to grab his phone and he fell over to the spot where I found him. Drugs are terrible. Not my experience, but a friend of the family who was the first responder. A teenage couple, boy and girl, were driving upwards of 100 miles per hour down a country road in Wisconsin at night. The male was driving and was wearing a seatbelt. The female was the passenger and was not wearing a seatbelt. The driver lost control and slammed into a tree. Our friend arrived first on the scene and found the teenage female had been thrown through the windshield and was in many pieces in the branches of the tree. The teenage male driver who was seat belted in was found nearly completely decapitated from his head to his body, with only a strip of neck flesh keeping his head attached. He had been driving so fast that the impact caused his seat belt across his chest to nearly slice his head from his body. I worked in CSI in Mexico, once we went to a safe house where the police found 14 people who were tortured and executed. You could smell the iron from the entrance. Upon entering, there were two women with broomsticks taped to the anus and the vagina. In the upstairs bathroom, they found a woman tied to the toilet, died of dehydration, had urinated, and defecated on her for days. It was evident that they also raped her and beat her before turning her into a toilet. One of the rooms had five shackles on the wall and a metal bucket with water in the center. The five people died of hunger and from beatings. The sickest was in the backyard, in a warehouse without windows. Several bodies had their faces and hands removed. It was like watching a horror movie, but that's the narco in these places, excuse my bad English. So, my mom used to do cleanup for a certain teal and yellow cleaning company and was the only one certified to do hazmat. They did cleaning for the county sheriff's department, and the one that stuck with her was in the back of a cruiser. They had a meth head, as they described him, but he was so tweaked out of his mind he kept rubbing his face back and forth across the dividing glass and managed to wear his face off from ear to ear. I got to see the pictures of it before cleanup, nearly 10 years ago, and it still haunts me to this day. Police officer here. Attended a scene where a guy went to his ex's house, walked in, and murdered her as well as her mother and teenage son. It was clear from the scene that he had gone in with a rifle and shot the three but that the son had attempted to crawl to a phone in the kitchen. He then went out to his car and grabbed his shotgun, and pumped a slug through each of their heads before putting one inside his own head. The son was in high school and was well on his way to college football. His girlfriend was scheduled to also be at the house but had last minute issues with a family illness. When I was in prison, we would take classes like HIV slash AIDS prevention, drug, and alcohol substance abuse, etc. Well, there was one class where guest speakers, who were friends with the chaplain, who ran the classes, would come share some pretty life-changing experiences with the group. At least that was the idea. One morning, a guy comes in, and he looks like a pretty normal dude. And he tells us as much too. Never been a drug addict, had no problems with alcohol, had a family, nice job, and he was a volunteer EMT, or something similar to it. He was tasked with cleaning up car crashes most of the time, so not crime scenes but some gnarly shit a lot of time. He continues on about how on a routine call, he and another guy were cleaning up a serious car wreck. Someone wrapped their truck around a tree. The guest speaker was cleaning blood out of the passenger side floorboards when his hand slipped, and he face planted in a puddle of blood. He knew immediately that he had it in his mouth and all over his face. I think some might have splashed in his eye. Anyway, the absolute worst case scenario ensues. The driver was HIV plus or some type of hepatitis, and he, in turn, became infected. His wife then fucking leaves him, she tells the kids slash family her father is gay, 
They harass the shit out of this poor guy, and basically all around ruin this guy's life. Everyone in that room, in prison, mind you, knew that it could be worse when he finished telling us that. He stuck around and answered a few questions. Not that many were asked. That was it. No feel-good stories, no happy endings. Sometimes life just fucking sucks. In Florida, bodies decompose really quick. We're talking a good stench within 48 to 72 hours. What no one's mentioned, I don't think, is that when you walk away from that smell, it doesn't matter because it's all you can smell for days. The smell gives me anxiety, so I end up wearing so much goddamn perfume just so I can try to smell anything else, and I always end up apologizing to my coworkers and or arrestees for the remainder of the shift. I'm a police officer and have been on a good number of death scenes. One that sticks out, in particular, was a suspicious death on the top floor maintenance stairwell of a five-story apartment building. I arrived and could smell the body from the bottom floor in the lobby. How it took this long for anyone to call in a building filled with a hundred people is beyond me. I got in the elevator and began to go up, the smell getting worse with each floor. My corporal was with me, and he started to look a bit sick. The door to the fifth floor opened, and I was hit with a smell I will never forget. The poor man was lying face down on the top floor landing, just inside the doorway to the stairwell. He had been there for about two weeks in the middle of July in the southeastern United States. The top floor was not air-conditioned as it was storage and maintenance, so it was around 100 degrees inside. The man was bloated, leaking his juices everywhere, and his skin was a necrotic black color. The juices were leaking down the stairs, dripping onto the landings of the fourth and third floors. Now, this was classified as a suspicious death, so a detective had to come out to see if we could rule out homicide, just to be sure. As my corporal was currently heaving out an open window, I had the privilege of assisting the detective with rolling this bloated corpse over to inspect it for wounds. I took hold of his arm and rolled, and I felt the arm begin to separate from the body as more death juices spilled from his torso. Luckily, no obvious wounds. When body removal came even, they were gagging. Again, I got to assist with moving the corpse onto the gurney. We put on full body Tyvek suits and masks to move him in case he burst. Luckily, he just leaked but did not split down the middle. 0 out of 10, do not recommend. Turns out he had a heart attack while on the landing, and nobody seemed to realize he was gone. Once he was identified, I realized I met him the week before when he called in about a woman who overdosed on heroin that he came across while mowing yards for work, the woman was given Narcan and survived. Small world. I also recently had a man who committed suicide by drinking polyurethane. In case you're wondering, no, drinking polyurethane is not a painless and easy way to exit this world. Funny paramedic story time. So, a woman calls 999, says she thinks her father is dead, call handler advises CPR, but the caller states it is too late. The crew arrives, and the paramedic approaches the remote house, speaks to the daughter, who is upset but advises she thinks it's too late. The paramedic enters the property and finds what is effectively a skeleton in the kitchen laid on the floor. History is that the daughter is fairly estranged and lives overseas from her father, normally sends Christmas cards and no other communication. After two years of no cards, and him not answering the phone, she flies home and finds him dead in his home. I got this tale third hand on a bad job stories night shift chat, so I cannot confirm if all details are 100% reliable, but it makes for a nice tale. Not a cleanup crew, but attend the scenes. An old gentleman had died in the bath. The top half of his body was all swollen and puffy, whereas his legs and lower torso and almost melted away. Essentially created a horrendous soup slash casserole mix in the bath. The coroners had to sift through the bath to find his liver which had come out. During the postmortem, autopsy, his testicles were so swollen they had to prick them just to drain out all the liquid. I just hate the smell, it seems to stick on your clothes. You come back into the office, and everyone can smell it on you. I was a tow truck driver, and the worst were motorcycle accidents usually. I've seen some really messed up car accidents, but I've seen motorcycle accidents where the driver was spread out several dozen yards across the pavement. A friend of mine is a cop. He just told me of a guy they found dead in his kitchen. The stove and heater were on, and he was naked. They assumed he was just cooking while naked. You know, how we all do from time to time. Can't remember how long he said he was dead for. When they lifted him up to turn him around, his penis had sort of melted to the kitchen floor. As they pulled him upwards, the dangling participle stretched off the floor like a rubber band and released. Slingshotting back to the body. It sounded absolutely disgusting as he described it. 
Does doing one on accident count? I used to do auto detailing in college for a car dealership. I was scrubbing the floor of a car, and no matter what I did, the water kept having a red tint to it. So, I pulled the seats and found about an inch of dried crusted blood and what I can only guess was brain matter or skull fragments. Turns out it was a suicide car that the dealership bought at auction. It had been detailed before being sold, but they never pulled the seats. We called the cops to confirm it was all logged and shipped the car back to auction. The dealership lost their ass on it but wanted it as far away from their lot as possible. I'm not a professional cleaner, but I have cleaned a murder scene before, unfortunately. My best friend was beaten to death with a baseball bat in his home. It's apparently pretty expensive to have these people come out and clean, and his parents didn't have it. Trying to do what we could to help out, a few of his friends got together to clean it. I don't have anything crazier to say that I haven't already about the scene. The entire experience was extremely surreal and not something I think about often. I'd say the craziest thing would have to be the weird places we'd find a speck of blood with seemingly no logical way for it to have gotten there. Logic, of course, had left that room before we got there. My dad's friend is a cop who works in a rural area and loves to tell my dad about the fucked up stuff he's come across. One of them was when he was sent to a call of a large group of people crying and coughing in an apartment. He gets there, and it's a large group of family members there cleaning up the shotgun suicide of a relative. That's when I learned that it's sometimes up to the departed's family to clean up after the death, and it's not always people in hazmat suits. I'm not a crime scene cleanup crew, but I did have to clean up my father's brains and blood from the room he killed himself in. The people basically just didn't do a thorough job. There were red streaks down the hallway walls from the blood-soaked bed being taken out, and it's like they didn't have a ladder because the walls of the room were clean until nearly the roof, then you could see splatters. I found a piece of rotted, I'm pretty sure, brain stuck to the top of the curtain rails. We believe there was also a smell from the blood soaking into the wooden floors, so we had to have those floors replaced. Police detective here. In a rural area, a guy had passed away in his yard. It was eight days before someone found him. He was partially liquefied, there were flies everywhere, and the stench was quite nasty. Knowing where these fly were before they landed on your face did not help. Had to shovel him in the bag with gas masks. FYI liquid people are quite toxic. I live on a small island near Japan, so we have Japanese tourists visit all the time. We have this popular beach which is listed as our top 3 tourist attractions. You had to climb down some stairs, as well as a ladder. Then you'd have to jump down 5 feet onto the sand, or water, to reach the bottom, or you could jump off the cliff straight into the water. The jump from the main cliff was just 15 to 20 feet. The thing about this beach is that when it gets rough, the waves hit the cliff sides, and when they do, they reach astounding heights. The waves would get so big that they'd reach the parking lot, which is about 35 feet away from the secondary cliff side. One summer, this Japanese male in his mid-twenties, seemed like an adrenaline junkie, went diving head-on into the waves when they were still mild. Still super dangerous, but mild compared to the waves that reach heights. Well, the next day or so, word had spread that he had passed. The locals said he was diving into the waves. Even after they advised him to stop. The guy would jump into the waves from the cliff, climb the ladder and stairs back to the top and jump right back in. The locals said they saw him repeatedly jump until he didn't. They called the police. Police arrived but couldn't do much for a while, for the water was still very rough. The mist, salt in the air, and sand mixed within the waves made it hard to see. They had to wait a couple of hours for the water to calm. They searched for his body and eventually found him in the waters of a nearby beach. He was headless. His body had almost spilled completely in the middle, and his legs were broken. They came to the conclusion that the waves had pushed him against the cliff head-on, so hard that his head was pushed into his own body as well. The rest of his injuries were because he was still being slammed against the cliff sides for hours. I heard a story of a guy who cleans up bodies from people jumping in front of trains. In this one case, they found a body with no head and couldn't for the life of them find the rest of it. In the autopsy room, they saw a tuft of hair coming out of where the head should be and realized he hit the train head on, and his head had caved into his chest through his neck. Hey, search and rescue personnel here. Working in Las Vegas, we see a ton of really messed up stuff. Chances are pretty high that we'll find an unrelated subject if we're looking for a missing person. The worst one was when we were deployed to find a female stuffed in a suitcase. After recovering the female in the suitcase, the coroner said it was the wrong female in a suitcase, and we were sent back out to find the right one. I guess I should clarify, 
Though we aren't a cleanup crew, we are often tasked with body recovery. The coroner's office does the packaging, and Lynn does the investigation. We then solemnly carry them out. Everyone needs to come home eventually.